African-American community. If you're God, you're awesome. Last summer, when over 100,000 black Americans gathered at this religious convention in Atlanta, when for three days, ministers preached to a rapt audience about the Bible, family values, virtue, vice, and God's plan. No one talked publicly about a silent killer, an epidemic familiar but forgotten, that today is hitting black Americans in stunning and disproportionate numbers. AIDS. The epidemic has not ended in the United States. It's only changed in who it impacts. Black people make up 13% of the U.S. population, but over 50% of all new cases of HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. That infection rate is eight times the rate of whites. In America, AIDS is virtually a black disease by every measure. Black women are 23 times more likely to be diagnosed with AIDS than white women. We should be in the streets. Everybody should be in the streets. Everybody should be freaked out. As of 2004, more than 200,000 African Americans have died. Still, despite these stunning statistics, AIDS is a topic that remains underground in black America. Silence is now suicide. The black America's silence on this issue is suicidal. In the future, people will look back at our generation and say, what were they thinking? Good evening. I'm Terry Moran. There are times in the news when we're not watching or listening closely enough, when we miss a story, a big, important story that goes underreported, mostly ignored. This is one of those stories. Let me give you one more statistic. AIDS is the leading cause of death among black American women ages 25 to 44, and it has been for 11 years. Last year, Peter Jennings began this report, and some of his work appears later in this program. It is my privilege to have picked up where Peter left off. Now, in the course of our reporting on this crisis, we discovered five important reasons that AIDS among African Americans is out of control. And as we explore them tonight, we'll talk about sex and race, neglect and denial. It's all certain to make some people uncomfortable. But this crisis demands attention now. The first reason AIDS is out of control among African Americans is ignorance. Ignorance among people in power. Ignorance among people who should know better. Take a look at this. In October 2004, when Vice President Dick Cheney and Democratic challenger John Edwards took the stage to debate, moderator Gwen Eiffel asked them this question. Mr. Vice President, in particular, I want to talk to you about AIDS, and not about AIDS in China or Africa, but AIDS right here in this country, where black women between the ages of 25 and 44 are 13 times more likely to die of the disease than their counterparts. What should the government's role be? When you asked it of the Vice President, what were you expecting? You know, I really was expecting that he'd have an answer. I was expecting that both of them would say, this is something we must address, and in my administration, we will. Well, this is a, uh, a great tragedy, Glenn, when you think about the enormous cost uh, here in the United States and around the world of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, I had not heard those numbers with respect to African-American women. I was not aware that uh, it was uh, that severe an epidemic there. I was surprised and frustrated because of the constraints of the debate. I couldn't say, what? <laughs> I couldn't say, how can that be, Mr. Vice President? And I was equally surprised that the Democrat had no answer. Senator Redford, you have 90 seconds. Yes, well, first, with respect to what's happening in Africa and Russia and, and other places around the world. Senator uh, Edwards didn't uh, seem to know much about the the epidemic in black America either. The AIDS epidemic in Africa, which is killing millions and millions of people. What kind of reaction did you get afterwards? The reaction I got from folks in the black community who said, what does this mean? Don't they care about us? The fact that you asked about AIDS in America and they answered about Africa is almost proof of just how invisible the issue is. Well, a lot of Americans are of the opinion that the problem is solved, that it's not an issue to talk about domestically anymore. Live from Cape Town, South Africa. But it's not just white leaders who talk a lot more about AIDS in Africa than at home. Many black American leaders and celebrities have gone off to fight the disease a continent away. Wear a condom and protect yourself. It's just easier because they can go and take a vacation, see the giraffes and the zebras. You know, I can go in the village and I can touch the people and I can have my emotional moment and I can get on my plane and I can fly back home and say I addressed HIV AIDS and therefore I don't have to do any more. And what has happened with the globalization of the AIDS fight is that it has been a false choice because we have to deal with all of it. And what kind of credibility can we have when we go to Sub-Saharan Africa or Eastern uh, Europe or Asia when we can't even solve the problem with folks who we see and work with every single day? Last year, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta announced that for the first time, more than a million Americans are infected with HIV. Almost half of them are black. As a scientist, you've been working on HIV AIDS from just about the beginning, yes. almost a quarter century. Right. Did you see this coming in the black American community? Uh, yes, 
you could see it coming. All you have to do is just sit down and think about it in pure, cold, infectious disease terms. It's a infectious disease that's transmitted by sexual contact, both homosexual sex, men who have sex with men, heterosexual contact, and injection drug use. So the handwriting was on the wall for quite a long time. If the government's most important aid scientists could see this crisis coming so clearly, why has there been no government policy or program aimed specifically at stopping the epidemic in black America? In fact, some government policies have made the problem worse. And that brings us to the second reason the African-American epidemic has gotten out of control, government failure. AIDS first took hold in the black community 25 years ago, in the inner cities, among addicts shooting intravenous drugs. The first time I did it, somebody um, kept telling me, you should try it, you should try it, you would like it. And he put the drugs in me, and I'm 17 years old, and he did this to me. Addicts sharing needles with other addicts spread the disease fast before anyone really understood that this was a way to get infected. My mother, she passed away from HIV. Sad and it seems, though. But then in the 1980s came the war on drugs, new state and federal laws that unintentionally sent the epidemic into overdrive. The war on drugs meant sending thousands more street-level drug offenders to prison, men who were more likely to be infected with HIV from dirty needles. Since 1980, the U.S. prison population has quadrupled. We're doing mass incarcerations of black men in America. More black, college-age black men are in prison than are in college. Many of them go into prison HIV negative, come out HIV positive, and we don't have a strategy to deal with this. Prisons are notorious breeding grounds for HIV. Infection rates are five times higher than outside the walls. Sex between men in prison has been the subject of only a handful of studies, but one study by a national police organization found that at least 40% of inmates had had sex with another man in prison. And despite strong evidence that condoms reduce the spread of AIDS, they are forbidden in all federal and most state and local prisons. To make condoms available in prison would be to admit that sex occurs in prison. And for some reason, the prisons don't want to say that happens. But if we want to encourage HIV transmission, it's the perfect policy. I think that would be the way to do it. In most prisons, testing is voluntary. AIDS activists say that's because if an inmate tests positive, he has a right to treatment, and the prisons don't want to pay the high cost. So men can leave prison infected with HIV and never know it. And most men say when they leave prison, they'll resume having sex with women. Well, I've looked at rates of incarceration throughout the state of North Carolina, 100 counties. And in those counties where the rates are highest, the rates of sexually transmitted diseases and HIV are also highest. So there, there is a relationship, a direct relationship between these two. All of this is the perfect storm for HIV. All of it comes together to create a situation where HIV could hardly be better off. Back on the streets, any serious attempts by government to bring the epidemic in black America under control have been haphazard and underfunded. There is one approach that has proven successful in other countries, needle exchange. In a few American cities like Baltimore, AIDS activists started needle exchange programs where addicts could trade in dirty needles for clean ones. All right, that's it. Grab that six in the shop. But in 1989, Congress banned the use of federal money to pay for these programs, and without federal funds, needle exchange has never been widely adopted. At first, many black leaders agreed with the ban on funding needle exchange, fearing it would encourage the use of drugs. But by the mid-1990s, most black leaders had changed their minds. And President Clinton seriously explored the possibility of federal funding, if the scientific evidence was clear and convincing. So we very carefully went over all of the data and came to the overwhelming conclusion. A, injection drug use does not get increased and B, needle exchange helps prevent HIV infection. No free needles help the addicts get off drugs, don't help the addicts have clean needles. Conservative opposition was unrelenting. And at that very moment, Clinton was overwhelmed by a crisis of his own making, so he had almost no political clout. He told his top officials to hold off on needle exchange. I didn't know what hold off meant, but I just got a cold, big pot of water thrown on me because I thought it was going to happen and it didn't. Today, this president continues to oppose federal funding for needle exchange, even though the co-chairman of his own advisory council on AIDS favors it. So you would support needle exchange program? Now that we have the data, yes. President Bush doesn't. Well, he's the president and I'm not, so... Uh, but he's wrong in your judgment. Well, I would, I would leave it there. He's the president and I'm not. Uh, I think this is a program that really should be seriously uh, looked at because if it saves lives, it really is, is important. The failure to fund needle exchange or any effective alternative is just one example of what the government could have done, but did not. Meanwhile, dirty needles still account for almost a third of all AIDS cases in black America.
It's been 11 years since the AIDS epidemic in the U.S. officially tipped and more black Americans than white Americans were infected. Today, it's spreading fast in a new population, heterosexual black women infected by men with HIV. And that points to a third reason. AIDS is out of control in black America. Now, this is something that's difficult to talk about. Sex and patterns of sexual behavior among black Americans that contribute to the epidemic. Consider this. Research at both the universities of Chicago and North Carolina has shown that multiple sexual relationships are more than twice as common among blacks than among whites, and among blacks, more common for men than for women. This may be one of the most important reasons HIV infection rates are so high among black Americans. Black people have higher rates of traditional sexually transmitted diseases like gonorrhea, um, herpes, syphilis, and it's pretty well known that those diseases facilitate the spread of HIV. It makes it easier to get HIV infection or to give it um, once you have um, one of these other sexually transmitted diseases. Once those rates start to rise, it starts a cycle that feeds on itself. Because now, when a person goes to have sex with somebody, the chances that that person's going to be infected already are relatively high. It turns out this pattern of sexual behavior is driven in part by a staggering demographic reality. There are only 85 black men for every 100 black women of marriageable age. That's because of a complex mix of vexing problems, infant mortality, violence, and disease, that all take a higher toll on black boys growing up in America than on any other racial group. With an imbalance of men and women, men have less of an incentive to stay in relationships. They have more options to have multiple relationships, and that is going to favor transmission of HIV. This is becoming especially clear in black communities in the South, where, according to the CDC, AIDS is spreading fastest. Places like Williamston, North Carolina. HIV and AIDS is the new story of the South. It is the new story. It is so disturbing to me when I, when I get another young sister to walk up in this office and say, can I talk to you? And then she pull me aside and say, I'm HIV infected. Donna Latimer runs an HIV counseling center in Williamston, where almost all the new clients are women. That demographic imbalance of men to women is especially pronounced here because unemployment is rampant. Several major factories in the area have shut down in the last few years, and small local businesses can't survive. So most men who can get work somewhere else leave town. If you implant an African-American male in this community that makes over minimum wage and, and women find out about him, I guarantee you at least 50 women are going to go after him, at least. According to the state health department, black women have an HIV infection rate 14 times higher than white women in North Carolina, and some misguided attempts to avoid the disease, according to Donna Latimer, are making things worse. I've seen people develop group sex teams because they said that they won't be putting each other at risk because we know everybody, so we can have sex with each other. But what happens when one member of that group is already infected? Then you infect the whole group. This small clinic, like many in the rural South, is overwhelmed with AIDS patients. Many are women like Kanisha, who says she was only involved with one man, the father of her child. But she tested positive for HIV three years ago. The man that you deal with, you don't trust them because they won't tell you the truth. So I just went and got tested. And when I first found out, I tried to commit suicide. AIDS is still a shameful but deadly secret in Williamston. A lot of people died. A lot of them had died around me approximately 10 to 15 that I'm friends with. It is impossible to know how many here have actually died of AIDS, because often when someone dies of AIDS, the notice in the local paper reports the cause was cancer. The man who Kanisha says infected her also had a wife and other children. He died of AIDS over a year ago. The epidemic is real, it's spreading. Women, protect yourself because you don't know who that person being with, so just protect yourself. A warning, but is anyone listening? The shocking reality is that of all women newly infected with HIV in the United States, 68% are black. If this was about white women, white college students, white youngsters, white anybody, there would be a different response. They used to have a saying that said, silence equals death. Well, if, if that is still true, then this silence is deafening. And it's saying to us, it does equal death. And for you guys, that seems to be all right. From the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, men have gotten infected because they had sex with other men. So a fourth reason AIDS is out of control in black America is what it means to be gay and black. 
After peaking in 1992, AIDS cases in gay white men have steadily declined. The Food and Drug Administration. White gay activists, largely affluent and educated, were galvanized into action. From the earliest days of the epidemic, they protested, formed political groups like ACT UP, raised money, and forced policy changes, which spanned everything from health insurance to faster FDA approval of experimental drugs. I think that the governmental response to HIV happens because the people who are dying were white. Because even though they were gay, they were white, <laughs> and they were male. And the power brokers in America are also white and male. And so, so on some level, there's an understanding that this could be my son, this could be my brother, you know, this could be someone in my life. But in the black gay community, there has been almost no organized activism. And that's been a significant force in the spread of AIDS. When you start talking about sex, there's a problem. And when you start talking about homosexuality, it's a real problem. Nobody wants to deal with it. I know a few communities as conservative as the African-American community, extremely conservative, particularly around sex. I ain't seen you in how many weeks now? David Mailbranch is an AIDS specialist at Grady Hospital in Atlanta. Um, how's everything going? He also studies the social and cultural forces that make life very difficult for black men who have sex with other men. The image of uh, black male sexuality being something, somebody who's hyper-heterosexual, uh, big masculine physique, um, large genitals, all those kind of stereotypes that have come back from the times of slavery, um, that's kind of wrapped up in what black male sexuality is. Being homosexual or having same-sex desire is not going to be compatible with that. It turns out that black men who are gay or bisexual sometimes decide to hide their sexual preference. Keeping homosexual or bisexual activity a secret is called being on the down low, or DL. The term refers to a man who presents himself to the world as straight, but has sex with other men and doesn't tell his female partners about it. As I mentioned at the beginning of this hour, the reporting on this crisis began last year by my colleague Peter Jennings. He sat down then with a group of black men in Atlanta, some gay, some straight, some bisexual, all HIV positive. They talked with remarkable candor about the realities of having AIDS in black America. I had full-blown AIDS, and the support that I thought I would get from my family didn't get. In, in the black community in America, is it wrong or looked down upon to be homosexual? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why? Because it's, quote-unquote, unnatural. So is AIDS uh, seen by some as a punishment for homosexuality? Absolutely. I one relative actually had the audacity to tell me that it was a gay disease and that I was an abomination to the body of Christ, that I had, should have never been born, and that um, I'm a disgrace to the family. Yeah. The, the social stigma behind HIV is so prevalent in our community. Mm -hmm. People are afraid to come out and say I'm HIV positive. Mm -hmm. Do you mean you think that the community would rather sit back and watch people die at an increasingly alarming rate rather than talk about it? It has been my experience that um, that's what's going on. Um, even though I'm living a gay lifestyle now, I was married for 16 years and had infected my wife and she felt like she couldn't go to her family to tell them. So for 16 years, my wife just went through this denial and shame, and she didn't want to take her medication, and, and she passed away last year, so. The girl that I'm dating right now, I gave her HIV. And I, I, I feel really bad about it, and, and, and I, things just went wrong, but uh, I didn't tell her to a year later. And that's the sad part about it. And, uh, but she accepts it. She, she doesn't have much choice, does she? If there are any number of black men on the down low, having sex with men and getting infected and having sex with women and not telling them they've had sex with men, um, a lot of black women have been infected unknowingly. Are you suggesting that the, that the group of us are going out intentionally infecting people? Well, I think in the case of Kevin, he knew his sexuality and he didn't tell his fiance. Again, who do we go to to say I'm having these feelings? I can recall talking to a group of women and asking them if their men or their husband actually came to them and said, I sleep with other men, how would they feel about that? And a lot of them said they didn't want to know. <laughs> and it, do you think your experience coming out as a gay person is a common experience? I think a great majority live more of a down low life. It is expected from the community, from the family, from the church that men, black men in particular, you know, marry, have families, have children, live happily ever after. You blame men? I absolutely blame men because the new infections for women are overwhelmingly as a result of heterosexual transmissions, let's face it. A few months after Peter's discussion with the men, we gathered a group of women to talk about many of the same issues. This whole thing. 
We trust and love our men deeply, and they are not being honest. They've embraced the lifestyle called the down low, which allows them to say, oh, I'm not gay, I'm just kicking it with my boys, which allows them to still be a man over here and be with their boys over here, and we're spreading it like wildfire. Another log on the fire, another log on the flyer, but sisters have got to know that we have got to protect ourselves at all costs. General, right. But is there, is there discomfort talking about HIV, AIDS, in the black community. I mean, for us to sit down and just have a, you know, a, a, a circle like this, yes. it just does not happen. It's the women who are infected and the women who are affected have been silent. And when you talk about African American, you talk about generations mm -hmm. of abuse. And we're talking going back. We were talking earlier about the secrets. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not just a black people's secret. It's a, it was a slavery secret. Cause you didn't mm -hmm. tell when Master came and got somebody out of the house, or Ma and it wasn't just Master. Yeah, it was the like son. <laughs> it was the sharecropper. <laughs> you didn't tell. You know. So it's the same thing. We didn't tell. We live with these secrets and we haven't told. Be I think for a lot of white people who may be listening, they're going to say, that was a long time ago. Do those patterns, do those forces still live? and still shape your life? Yes, do you? Yes, do you yeah, but let's talk about it. Let's talk the fact of the matter is, is that we still live in that culture, so we don't discuss that our sons have HIV or our uncles or our brothers have HIV or our daughters are infected. Right, How so, do you address these So questions? there's a 20-year-old, say, and she's about to go out on a date. What, what does she need to know? 20 questions. Do you have a girlfriend? Do you have a boyfriend? <laughs> have you ever had sex with a man? Because some men will say, no, I don't have a boyfriend, and say, That's no, right. that I'm not bisexual, That's but right. still, uh, they, they've right. had sex with When you go out, is this on your mind? Oh, yeah. Um, but. I don't know that it's on every 24-year-old's mind. Did you ask your boyfriend to get tested? Yes. Let's do this. You How know. How did you respond? Fine with it. Nothing to hide, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. She did that because she respects herself. Yeah. And I guarantee you, he respects her more. Yeah. Right. And that brings us back to the bottom line. How do we reduce the numbers of HIV cases in the African-American community? We have to be a force to be reckoned with. However, it has to, ha it has, it has to happen. Because it's not going to get better. It's not going to get easier. We'll be here three years from now, a little more gray hair, a little less hair, a little more skin, having the same conversation if the black community don't stand up and adhere now. Okay. They have to adhere now. The fifth reason that AIDS is out of control in black America may be the most surprising, even the most important. Two weeks ago at the International AIDS Conference in Toronto, NAACP leader Julian Bond declared that there has been a failure to lead in the black community. In fact, in 25 years, no prominent black leader has made the AIDS epidemic here a top priority. He got up and I said, a risen Savior. Start with the church. Black Americans are deeply connected to their religious roots. Over 80% say religious faith is important in their daily life. Historically, the African-American church has been the cornerstone of political action, of uh, social justice, and of spiritual empowerment. It is the center of life. Our churches continue to be the center of our community and how we think about certain issues. Church, say amen. Say amen again. Amen. amen. But the church that took on civil rights has mostly been unwilling to take on AIDS. Calvin Butts of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York has just recently started to talk about it in his church. You need to be monogamous, at least, and stop all the promiscuity that is so characteristic of American heterosexual and homosexual behavior. You just can't sleep with everybody you think you want to sleep with and have sex with everybody you think you want to have sex with. Has the black church in general done enough on AIDS in black America? No. The black church has not done enough on AIDS in black America. And the reason I say that is because the crisis is worsening. So when you see the numbers going up, you know you're not doing enough. And the one voice that continues to be prominent and powerful in the African-American community comes out of the church. P.D. Jakes is a well-known and respected televangelist and preacher. He has an AIDS ministry at his home church in Texas. But last summer in Atlanta, in front of tens of thousands of people, he chose not to preach about AIDS. Originally, there were no scriptures uh, about AIDS in the Bible. The Apostle Paul didn't leave us any scriptures how he dealt with those issues. And so we don't see answers in the Bible. We're not getting that kind of training at universities. And pastors are kind of feeling their way. It's a tough business, the sun. Jakes is not alone in keeping AIDS out of the spotlight. Nearly every black leader we spoke to told us the black community must confront a whole constellation of challenges, and AIDS is just one of them. I don't think that they're afraid to touch the subject. It's just that it is one of the many crises that we face. We don't have the luxury of honing in on one issue consistently. It's life and death. So excuses that we're busy. We would have dealt with this life and death crisis, but we were busy. Doesn't cut it. I see the black church being challenged as never before. 
to have some tough conversations, and they're going to happen. Those black tough conversations are going to happen because the black church doesn't have an option, because the black church is the only thing black people have left. Eugene Rivers is also a pastor at a tiny church in one of Boston's poorest neighborhoods. The politics of holiness. Righteousness exalts a nation. He's already taken on social issues like gangs and drugs, and now he's turning his attention to AIDS. In terms of how we live our lives. You said silence is now suicide. Silence is suicide. The conspiracy of silence on this sexual, moral, and cultural crisis is suicidal because black young people are dying unnecessarily. Rivers sees a fatal intersection between the silence of black leaders on AIDS and a popular culture supported by blacks and whites that's full of images of risky behavior. We've got a culture that celebrates ignorance, you know, and promiscuity and, and consumerism and the bling bling. Uh, we, we've got a cultural crisis. We have turned the celebration of misogyny, middle range pornography, masquerading as hip hop into a mainstream industry. And this is something the black community did. And black men and women passing around multiple partners, creating new sexually transmitted diseases and multiple sexually transmitted diseases, it's got to be talked about. And so I think that within the black community, we have met the problem, and the problem is us. And, and, and a black political leadership class bereft of vision, intellectual direction, and a clear moral compass now have failed their children. Jesse Jackson is probably the most recognized African-American leader. He's spoken about AIDS and been publicly tested for HIV. But he's better known for his focus on other issues. You, in the eyes of many Americans, assumed a mantle of leadership in, in black America. And this happened on your watch. You know, when this epidemic first broke, I think most Americans misread it. At first, it was thought to be white male gay disease. And that community with its resources and resourcefulness addressed it big time. Those with least resources were least effective. My God, when I think about its rise in Africa, even today, I was with Nelson Mandela about two weeks ago. In South Africa, 5.2 million people have HIV or AIDS. I'm asking about America, though, and I'm asking about leadership. And there are now hundreds of thousands of black Americans with this disease, and there are activists who say, where were you? Why hasn't there been a mass mobilization of Push Rainbow, of NAACP, Urban League, around the Congressional Black Caucus, around this crisis? Well, the U.S. president, you blame the, 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 the U.S. Congress, I'm not blaming anybody. My point is, those who have the most access to media and resources must address any American crisis. There are many people speaking against AIDS all the time, but have no platform. But you do have that platform. And the extent to which we do have it, we use it. I wonder, though, you had a very public revelation about your own private life. Do you ever think that a kid in the audience, a teenager, might look up to you and hear you talk about behavior and think, well, yeah, Jesse fooled around. Well, why, why is he telling me I can't? There's, there's He's a hypocrite. I, I would suggest to them that um, we use our experiences to teach every football coach has fumbled the ball. It does not make him less of a coach. Sometimes it's your own experience that gives you the power to speak and to speak truth to crisis, the truth to power in ways that it matters. And when you do that, you become believable. It was a full decade ago, 1996, the last time the entire AIDS quilt was laid out in public. Remember the quilt? It covered the Washington Mall each panel memorializing someone who died of AIDS. Thousands of people came to see it. But even then, the faces on the quilt represented only a fraction of the actual number of Americans who had died of AIDS. And most of the faces were white. Today, the quilt is tucked away in a nondescript warehouse in Atlanta. It's a reflection of the attitudes of most Americans toward AIDS, that the epidemic is no longer an issue in this country, not something we have to worry about. But this year, almost 20,000 Americans will die of AIDS, and most of them will be black. It should scare us to death. It should keep us awake up at night. And if we sleep, we should be having nightmares. The more this epidemic becomes black and brown, the more you will find and the more you will see people, individuals, groups, community, society, government, back away. But remember, whatever negatively impacts one segment of our population, 
eventually gets to it all. Drugs, age, crime. So don't look at me and say, ah, yeah, a bunch of poor black people, let them die. It's coming back unless we do something about it. We began this program by acknowledging that we in the media have missed the story of the AIDS epidemic in black America. The politicians, the pastors and celebrities and many community activists have missed it, neglected it or ignored it too. And now we are all reckoning with the costs of that. So now there is work to be done by all of us. More money for education, prevention and of course treatment in the black community. That's crucial. But so is leadership. And that includes challenging a popular culture that too often celebrates misogyny, irresponsibility and anti-gay bigotry. And ignorance is no longer an excuse. I'm Terry Moran. Thanks for joining us. Good night. The Little League World Series, Saturday at 3.30 Eastern on ABC.